to lift off when the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading you loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, no problem. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the November 27, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Michael Abdilla, and I have Tina Stagg with me tonight, and we are both from the Space Association of Australia. So let's go straight to Tina and get the show started. Thanks, Michael, and good evening, space fans. We'll head straight into some NASA news with the Commercial Crew Program. Boeing issued a strong critique of a NASA Inspector General report about the commercial crew program. Boeing criticised many of the conclusions of the report, including that much of the additional $287 million the agency provided Boeing for additional flexibilities in its commercial crew work was unnecessary. Boeing said the report's estimate of $90 million a seat on a CST-100 Starliner compared to $55 per seat on SpaceX's Crew Dragon, was too high, but declined to give its specific seat price. Boeing also took issue with statements by unnamed NASA officials in the report that they needed to give Boeing additional money to keep them from dropping out of the program. Any implication that we ever wavered in our participation in commercial crew is false, the company said. That same Office of Inspector General report also found that NASA's utilisation of the ISS will drop severely next year because of commercial crew delays. The report said the agency would have just a single astronaut on the ISS starting in the northern spring, which would reduce the amount of research performed to just 5.5 hours a week. With a standard three-person crew, each astronaut can perform nearly 12 hours of research a week. The report warned that NASA risks losing access to the ISS entirely by next October unless commercial crew vehicles enter service or NASA is able to arrange additional Soyuz seats. NASA criticised the report's projected outcome as a worst-case scenario that didn't reflect the agency's efforts to mitigate them. Roscosmos said it had received a formal request from NASA for additional Soyuz seats and would make a decision soon. Meanwhile, Boeing's CST Starliner commercial crew vehicle was stacked atop its Atlas V rocket last week. The spacecraft was moved from a former space shuttle hangar at the Kennedy Space Centre to Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, where it was installed on top of the Atlas V rocket. The spacecraft is scheduled to launch on December 17 on an uncrewed test flight to the International Space Station. While no people will be on the spacecraft, it will have an anthropometric test dummy on board, which Boeing said is named Rosie the Astronaut, after Rosie the Riveter of World War II frame. And to the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, NASA added five companies, including Blue Origin and SpaceX, to its Commercial Lunar Lander Program. Those companies, along with Sarah's Robotics, Sierra Nevada Corporation and TIVAC Nano Satellite Systems, received contracts last week for NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. The companies joined nine others eligible to compete for an expected average of two task orders a year to deliver NASA payloads to the surface of the Moon. NASA emphasised landers with larger payload capacities in this competition, with Blue Origin offering its Blue Moon Lander and SpaceX its Starship vehicle, which the company says could land up to 100 metric tonnes on the Moon. But adding more companies to NASA's Commercial Lunar Lander program has some worried its value is diminishing. Some of the original nine companies claimed the value of the contract was now diluted with the new entrants. But they also said the program remained valuable for jump-starting commercial lunar missions while providing other intangible benefits like aiding in recruiting and financing. And to NASA's moon program, NASA will request ideas for a lunar rover to be used by astronauts. 
In a conference speech last week, Tom Kremens, NASA Associate Administrator for Strategy and Plans, said the agency would soon release a request for information for an unpressurised lunar rover for use by astronauts on Artemis moon landing missions. NASA plans to develop the rover through a public and private partnership and have it ready in time for the first Artemis lunar landing in 2024. Kremen said NASA was also looking beyond 2024 for additional capabilities needed for later lunar landings, including a larger pressurised rover and a habitat. And turning to the US Air Force... The Government Accountability Office sided with Blue Origin in the company's protest of an Air Force launch competition. The GAO said it sustained the protest the company filed regarding the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 competition, which claimed the terms of the procurement unduly restricted competition were ambiguous or inconsistent with customary commercial practice. GAO sided with the Air Force on other aspects of the protest. The GAO decision is under seal because it contains proprietary company information, but the agency said it was working to make a public version available. The Air Force said it was reviewing the part of the protest sustained by the GAO and expects to resolve this issue definitively and expeditiously. The Air Force also said it would revise the criteria it plans to use to evaluate proposals for launch services. In its request for proposals earlier this year, the Air Force said it would make two awards for the National Security Space Launch Program by picking two independently developed proposals that, when combined, offered the best value to the government. The GAO recommended the removal of the words, when combined. Will Roper, the Air Force's senior acquisition executive, said the words would be removed so each proposal was judged independently on its own merits. And over to Mike. Thank you, Tina. And let's move to some European news. Funding for exploration programs will be a key topic for debate at the European Space Agency's ministerial meeting this week. The agency will seek funding to start work on elements for NASA's Lunar Gateway and additional European-built service modules for the Orion spacecraft. The nearly €2 billion ESA wants for exploration programs includes funding for Mars exploration, such as preparatory work for a Mars sample return in cooperation with NASA. The European Space Agency will set aside funds to ensure a successful return to flight of the Vega rocket next year. Thilo Kranz, head of ESA's Space Transportation Technology Coordination Office, said the funding would be in the range of the lower double digits millions of euros and would be used to ensure the problem that caused the Vega launch failure in July had been corrected. The ESA funding covers several recommendations that a failure review panel made regarding testing and inquiries about materials used in the vehicle. Meanwhile, the head of the European Space Agency has called for immediate action by governments and companies alike to address the space debris issue. In a speech last week, Jan Werner cited concerns about the mega constellations and the impact they will have on space debris. Companies launching such systems should ensure each satellite does not become space debris tomorrow, acting on a moral and ethical basis rather than waiting for regulations. Werner said he would propose a debris mitigation program that included in-orbit servicing, active debris removal and active debris avoidance at this week's ESA ministerial meeting. And turning to India, 
The Indian government says a problem with braking thrusters caused its Vikram lander to crash on the moon in September. In a written response to questions from India's parliament, a government minister said the lander slowed more than the designed value during the second phase of its descent, which ultimately caused it to hard land 500 metres from the expected landing site. The statement didn't explain what caused the deviation during the descent. This was the first formal acknowledgement by the Indian government that the lander had crashed. Moving to commercial space news. The first prototype of a SpaceX Starship vehicle was damaged during testing last week. The Starship Mark I tanks were being pressurised for a test at SpaceX's Boca Chica, Texas site when a bulkhead ruptured, causing a plume of material to erupt from the top of the vehicle and throwing part of it into the air. The company said there were no injuries during the incident and claimed it was not a serious setback. Company CEO Elon Musk unveiled the Starship Mark I at an event nearly two months ago, saying the vehicle would fly to an altitude of 20 kilometres in the next one to two months. In a statement after the anomaly, SpaceX said the company had already decided not to fly the Mark I vehicle, a decision it had not previously disclosed. SpaceX will instead turn its attention to a Mark III version also under construction. And in more SpaceX news, the recent launch of 60 SpaceX Starlink satellites has reignited concerns among astronomers about the effect such mega constellations will have on their work, although in some cases the impact will not be as bad as once feared. The Starlink satellites are particularly bright in the early evening and morning as they reflect sunlight, causing astronomers to worry that the satellites could interfere with their observations. An astronomer at the European Southern Observatory found that if 27,000 such satellites are launched, they would only interfere with 0.8% of long exposure observations made around dawn and dusk. And since the observatory doesn't take such observations at those times, the satellites won't be a problem for us, he said. The satellites are a bigger concern for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope under construction, whose astronomers worry they could lose significant amounts of observing time around dawn and dusk because of the satellites. Astronomers using images taken by the Blanco Telescope in Chile have already complained about the effect of the satellites. And it's back to you, Tina. Thanks, Mike. And in further commercial news, United Launch Alliance plans for a new upper stage for its Vulcan rocket are becoming less clear. Vulcan will launch in 2021 using a version of the Centaur upper stage currently flying on the Atlas V. ULA had planned as recently as 2018 to replace Centaur with the Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage, or ACES, in 2023, but the company now says it has no specific timeline for ACES. That upper stage would have the ability to operate in space for weeks instead of hours, enabling transport between orbits and more missions beyond Earth, while also increasing how much Vulcan could lift. And to Virgin Galactic and Credit Suisse is bullish about the company. The investment firm gave an outperform rating on Virgin Galactic stock last week, saying the suborbital spaceflight company is attractive since it estimates revenues will be three times its costs once it begins Spaceship 2 commercial flights. Credit Suisse also said Virgin had a monopoly on the space tourism market in the near term, claiming it was at least two years ahead of Blue Origin, even though the company has already flown its New Shepard vehicle multiple times and is preparing to soon begin crewed test flights. 
Despite the upbeat assessment, shares in Virgin Galactic fell more than 7% in trading last week. And to the Sierra Nevada Corporation, and the company has announced the cargo module for its Dream Chaser spacecraft will be known as Shooting Star. The module, attached to the rear of the Dream Chaser vehicle, will allow the spacecraft to carry additional cargo to the International Space Station. After departing, the module will separate and burn up in the atmosphere to dispose of garbage, hence the Shooting Star name. The company unveiled the first of those cargo modules last week at the Kennedy Space Centre. Back to Mike. Thank you, Tina. And let's move to some other space news. Planetary scientists have completed the first geological map of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. The map, published last week, uses radar imagery from NASA's Cassini spacecraft, supplemented with infrared images and spectra, to study the surface of the haze-enshrouded moon. The map identified six different types of geological features, from dunes to lakes, all similar to features found on Earth. And that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you, Tina, and we'll talk to you again next week. Good night. Good night.